The massacre known as the Night of Sorrow was the worst single disaster of 1968. But the world barely noticed. The Mexican government shrouded the massacre in secrecy. Only recently has it been officially acknowledged and investigated. But it was a turning point in Mexican history. The night when one party rule lost whatever legitimacy it had. From this terrifying event in which over 500 young men and women died, uh, a new Mexico was born. A new democratic Mexico that has finally flowered in these days, in the 1990s. It took a long time, but it would not have happened without the events of 1968. The massacre took place just before the Olympics in Mexico City and horrified Harry Edwards, who was organizing a boycott of the games by black athletes. There were so many people being picked up, uh, so many people being killed that they were literally hauling up corpses nets under helicopters like they did in Vietnam because they did not want uh, uh, mass funerals and so forth uh, either just prior to and most certainly not during the, the Olympic Games. The world heard very little about the student massacre, but no one missed the black power protest at the Olympics by American sprinters Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Smith and Carlos' demonstration was not anti-American. It was pro human rights, and most specifically, pro-black rights. People either wept and cheered, or they were outraged to the rafters. Smith and Carlos were expelled from the Olympics, but their black power salute became one of the most provocative and enduring images of 1968. I turned your whole car upside down I caught you cheating and running around There's a smile up on your face While another takes my place And there'll be laughter and instead of fear More than ever, conservative Americans thought the country and the world were on the verge of a nervous breakdown. They wanted law and order. George Wallace was their man. Well, I'm for Wallace because I feel that uh, all through history, whenever times became so difficult, a leader has arose, and this is the leader. Independent presidential candidate George Wallace had once declared segregation forever. Now the Alabama governor was holding rallies as far north as San Francisco, and polls in October showed him winning 20% of the vote. With America, the rioting, the trouble in the streets, the trouble in our schools, the Supreme Court, uh, which is almost, well, let's say, we think is pro-communist. Now let's talk about law and order a moment. And we need to talk about it, but really you don't have to talk about it. You see it all around you all the time. The breakdown of law and order. The reaction that he stirred scared me. Uh, because he had the capacity of just working up a crowd to a, f to a frenzy. When that same group from Berkeley were groveling around in their beards and filth in Salem, Alabama for eight weeks, the Washington Post said, it is a great and holy crusade, and now they've created themselves a Frankenstein monster, and the chickens are coming home to roost all over this country. Wallace enjoyed responding to the protesters who heckled him. Come up here after I've completed my speech and I'll autograph your sandals for you. I'll let you uh, uh, do that. And I'll, uh... Oh, yeah, a good haircut would help you. I think that's all your problem. A good barber could cure you. It was really the uh, beginning of what is today the, uh, the phenomenon of the angry white man. And I'll tell you, they ought to take them people over there and put them in a bunch of cages and ship them off in a ship and dump them. Or take them to Vietnam, get them off, put them on the front line and bring our boys back and A-bomb them guys. It also contained an element of economic populism that was very important. Of course, his people were trying to beat the hell out of me, so it's it hard for me to see their economic agenda. <laughs>
the more mainstream law and order candidates, Nixon and Agnew, built up a commanding lead over the hapless Hubert Humphrey. Nixon ran a very controlled, almost antiseptic campaign, dominated by Madison Avenue advisors who recommended carefully orchestrated appearances. It would later be described as the selling of the president. The Humphrey campaign was stalled. He was afraid to break with President Johnson and speak out against the war. After the debacle in Chicago, the anti-war movement was boycotting Humphrey. This is one of the greatest mistakes of the 60s, in my view. Um, the election was so close that you can attribute many factors to the margin of difference. But certainly one of the factors was that uh, those who, were, who hated the war decided to be so pure as to sit it out. I was one of them. Uh, I know very few people who voted in that year, and we were wrong. It would never have entered my mind to vote for Hubert Humphrey, uh, who was, as far as I was concerned, was deeply implicated in the war. Late in the campaign, Humphrey did finally say he would unconditionally stop the bombing of North Vietnam. Immediately, his poll numbers shot up. He was now closing in on Nixon. I think if he had renounced the Johnson war policy uh, maybe a few weeks sooner, uh, he might very well have won that election. He came very, very close. Nixon won by a razor-thin margin, less than 1% of the vote. The Vietnam War would last seven more years. Johnson's war became Nixon's war. It's important for the youth of a generation to feel that they can change the world, because they really can because the youth of the world are the conscience of the world, and we depend on them to make things change. And that was a time of tremendous change where youth were tremendously motivated. It would be good to see that happen again. For the generation that came of age with John Kennedy and the Beatles, the defining year was 1968. As Jules Whitcover has written, it's the year when the dream of a nobler, optimistic America died, and the reality of a skeptical, conservative America began to fill the void. I think there's an amount of bitterness and animosity that our generation is going to carry to its grave. It is a generation forged by the war in Vietnam and the struggle for racial equality, a generation robbed of hope by political assassination, it was the year a spirited, rebellious generation lost its innocence. 68 is the cusp between uh, the hope and the rage, and it's in many ways the years when the most benign hopes burned out or were obliterated.